In the fall of 1962, one of four Soviet Foxtrot-class submarines set course for Cuba, outfitted with a nuclear torpedo. B-59's mission was no small feat, as the island the submarine was hovering over had been placed under strict blockade by President John F. Kennedy. Upon being noticed by American radars, a U.S. Navy task force began forcing the Russian submarine to come to the surface. However, the Soviets believed they were being attacked. On October 27, 1962, for approximately four hours, and about 400 feet below the Caribbean Sea, a quiet Russian naval officer found himself in the middle of a nuclear standoff alongside his captain, the consequences of which could alter the world forever. The only man that now stood between a full-fledged nuclear war and the world's safety was Vasily Arkhipov. Under the Sea On October 1, 1962, Soviet diesel-electric Foxtrot-class submarine B-59 sailed from her base in the Kola Peninsula in northwest Russia on her way to the Caribbean. The submarine was the flagship of a detachment in support of Operation Anadir. Nikita Khrushchev's top-secret effort to deliver ballistic missiles to Cuba was codenamed Anadir after a river near the Bering Sea, and the idea was to make Western intelligence believe they were headed somewhere cold. However, things started to go wrong inside the 295-foot-long submarine from the get-go. Cruising hundreds of feet underwater, all 12 officers 10 warrants and 56 seamen inside the submarine often went seasick because of the extreme motion, and the men had to hold on to something, even as they slept, or else they would fall. Communication was also tricky, and once the crew floated past Iceland, the submarines lost contact with Moscow. By then, they were only a third into their journey. When United States President John F. Kennedy learned of Operation Anadir on October 16th, the Soviet detachment was already halfway across the Atlantic. Soviet Missiles in Cuba On October 14, 1962, as pilot Major Richard Hazer made a high-altitude pass over Cuba aboard his U-2 spy plane, he photographed a Soviet-made SS-4 medium-range ballistic missile being assembled for installation. This sighting set off one of the most significant Cold War confrontations between the world's two superpowers. Only a year before, a landing operation on the southwestern coast of Cuba by Cuban exiles who opposed Fidel Castro's U.S.-financed and directed revolution failed miserably. Then, after the Bay of Pigs invasion, Cuba asked the now emboldened Soviet Union for assistance. Soviet Premier Khrushchev complied and began sending missiles to the Caribbean nation to deter further American aggression. Only 90 miles south of mainland Florida, nuclear-armed Cuban missiles could easily reach targets in the continental United States. If operational, the missiles would fundamentally change the structure of the nuclear rivalry between Russia and the United States, which had primarily been dominated by the Americans up to that point. Blockade Five days after President John F. Kennedy learned of the Soviet plans, he announced a quarantine on Cuba to prevent missiles from reaching the island. In addition, the United States announced that it would not allow offensive weapons to be delivered to Cuba and demanded that the already delivered ones be dismantled and returned to the motherland. By then, the Russians were already approaching the island, and they took these limitations as an act of aggression. The diplomatic ties between the two countries began to crackle, leaving many people fearing that nuclear war was looking more and more likely by the day. On the morning of October 24th, President Kennedy gathered the National Security Council's Executive Committee, a special counsel made for the Cuban Missile Crisis, and discussed the Soviet submarine threat and the dangerous possibility of an incident. Soon, messages regarding American submarine surfacing and identification procedures were transmitted to Moscow and other governments around the world. Within a few days, U.S. Navy units patrolling the Caribbean identified a task force of several Soviet submarines approaching Cuba and began tracking them with detection technology. While instructed not to attack the submarines unless provoked, the United States Navy was ordered to signal Soviet submarines and induce them to the surface to identify themselves. However, when the Soviet Naval Command ordered B-59 to change course, the submarine began to move toward the Sargasso Sea. Once there, 
The submarine had trouble operating in the warmer waters, as she had been explicitly built to float near the motherland. And as the inside of the submarine rose up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the carbon dioxide did as well, and the men began to fall like dominoes. A sudden attack. Amidst all the fainting, the lack of air, and the inoperable air conditioning equipment, the Russian submarine was suddenly attacked by the Americans. According to Vladimir Orlov, a communication specialist aboard the submarine, the charges felt like someone blasting a metal barrel with a large sledgehammer. B-59's captain, Valentin Savitsky, already knew about the rising tensions between America and Russia from the communication of the previous days, but was now unable to receive radio signals nor use the ship's antenna. Thus, he had no way of learning about the most recent developments, and the Russians couldn't help but wonder if their beloved motherland was already at nuclear war. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier USS Randolph and 11 destroyers dropped depth charges above the water's surface. Per naval standards, depth charges are not meant to harm foreign vessels, but instead call their attention. And while Moscow had already been notified by the United States about the Navy's intent to employ practice charges as part of its Cuban blockade, the crew aboard B-59 had not received this warning due to poor communication. The American convoy also attempted to reach the submarine several times, but failed. Convinced that an all-out conflict had broken out, Captain Savitsky yelled, quote, We're going to blast them now! Exhausted, starving, and on edge, the submarine commander decided to attack the American naval force above them. A crucial decision. It didn't matter that B-59 had not communicated with Moscow for 11 days, as Naval Command had authorized the vessel to launch the torpedo if deemed necessary. Still, Soviet naval regulations required the agreement of the submarine's top three officers before a nuclear weapon could be used. As such, Savitsky turned to Ivan Maslenikov, his deputy political officer, and Vasily Arkhipov, his second-in-command. While Maslenikov immediately gave the captain his blessing, Arkhipov refused and wouldn't go along with it. The 34-year-old Arkhipov, Savitsky's equal, was the flotilla commander responsible for all three Russian submarines on the secret mission to Cuba. As he approached the commander, he boldly argued that they were not being attacked. A quiet and simple man, Arkhipov now sat inside an old, diesel-powered submarine with no air conditioning and about to have the most important conversation of his life, one that could have extreme implications all around the world. Hot debate. The exact details about what happened inside the submarine are still disputed. According to some accounts, Arkhipov simply argued that there was no way the Americans were trying to destroy the Russian submarine. He claimed that the dozens of charges dropped on them had caused no significant damage. If the United States had actually wanted to destroy B-59, they would have done so already. Arkhipov insisted that the ship was not in danger and that they were being asked to surface instead. Because the last information update was so long ago, and their orders so vague, Arkhipov believed that the best way to proceed would be to surface and communicate with the Americans as much as they loathed them. That seemed like a better idea than potentially triggering a nuclear exchange. After pondering the course of action, Savitsky obliged and ordered the submarine to surface. Upon breaking the water, they were met by an American destroyer, and the two sides talked respectfully. No one boarded the Russian submarine, nor inspected her cargo. After a few more minutes, the Russians were ordered to turn away from Cuba, and the submarine headed north, back to the motherland. The following day, the United States and the Soviet Russian representatives reached an agreement. Publicly, the Soviets agreed to dismantle their offensive weapons in Cuba and return them to the Soviet Union for UN verification in exchange for a public declaration and agreement from the United States to not invade Cuba ever again. Secretly, however, the United States also agreed to dismantle all of the Jupiter medium-range ballistic missiles that had been deployed to Turkey against the Soviet Union. As such, the Cuban Missile Crisis, considered by many as the closest time the Cold War came to escalating into a full-fledged nuclear war, was over. Aftermath Neither the United States Navy grenade tossers, nor the majority of the public, knew at the time that one of B-59's torpedoes was a 15-kiloton nuclear warhead. 
This crucial fact went unknown for four decades, until the former belligerents met at a 50th anniversary reunion. With roughly the same power as the bomb dropped on top of Hiroshima, a nuke of that size would have had incredibly dire consequences. Had Captain Savitsky's orders been carried out, chances are that the Americans would have responded accordingly, potentially starting a Third World War. What Vasily Arkhipov exactly said to Savitsky that fateful day aboard B-59 will never be known. Still, many historians from both sides of the story credit Vasily Arkhipov with single-handedly saving the world. Thank you for watching Dark Seas. Don't forget to hit the like button and share this video with someone you think might like it. And for more history-inspired content, click on the screen and check out our other Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned.